Hey, I'm Kelly Hogan. I used to be a total sugar addict. I used to be obese. I used to have a lot of inflammation and health problems. And I remember that there were times in my life when I didn't know what the problem was. I legitimately thought the problem was eating too much dietary fat. So instead of steak, ribs, and chicken wings, I thought I would be better off eating salads. I ate a lot of salads. It did not help me. It would help for a little while. I could lose some weight. I was eating less food. And then I would get hungry or I would feel no energy or I couldn't sleep. I would get leg cramps. I felt lousy. So I would start eating, gain the weight back, back at square one. But then I also know that there were times when I was pretty sure I did know what needed to be done. I was pretty sure I did need to cut out the chips and fries and sugar junk, processed junk. I never really thought that was helping me. But there were times when, to be honest... That was really hard. So I had an idea. This isn't good for me, but it was hard to just start. And that's what I hear from some folks. Some people literally don't have a clue what they need to do. So they just ask for advice. They hear, oh, you should eat meat, cut out carbs. And they're like, yes, I will do that. And they do it. And then others hear it and they say, but how? I can't get started. Like mentally, I know what needs to be done. I'm just not able to do it. If that's you right now, this video is for you. And I'm going to try to keep this pretty short and concise. First of all, if you are desperate in this moment and you feel like that is working against you because you have health problems, you have huge reasons why you need to do this, whether it's just you need to lose weight or you you hurt, you have pain, you have issues, that desperation is actually a big asset to you. The more desperate you are, the more you need change, the more you feel like you are just gasping for air to get something to be better, that is going to work in your favor. Embrace it. Write it down. What do you need to change? What is your reason why? And really dwell on that and see every bit of that as a plus. People who come to try to make change and all they really want to do is lose the last five to 15 pounds. They aren't desperate. And very often the changes they make are temporary if they ever start at all. If you feel some level of desperation, that's good. That's good. We can work with that. You know what else is good? Hope. I don't need you to just be desperate and laying on the floor, you know, <laughs> gasping for air. Have some hope, people. Did you know that if you were to throw rats into a seemingly helpless experiment, such as they've taken rats and put them in water where they can't reach the bottom, they're just swimming and swimming and swimming, that the rats will give up, go to drown at a certain mark. But if you take those same rats and right before they start sinking and drowning, you save them, you pull them out, they will last longer and longer every time you put them in there. I know it's really cruel. I have not personally conducted these experiments, but I hear that the idea of giving someone hope that if you just hang on a little longer, that help is coming, change is coming, allows people to last longer. Have hope. Look for inspiration. This is one reason why in my meetings, I want people to speak up and share what has changed for the better for you since you made this change in your diet and lifestyle so other people can hear it and be inspired and have hope. So watch YouTube videos of people who have gotten help for people who have gotten results. Allow it to get into your brain and say to yourself, they did this. I can do this too. Hope abounds. Hope is good. So now you're desperate, you've got some hope, now you need a plan, baby. And I'll go ahead and tell you, the greatest plan that I could offer for you is to cut out processed foods, sugar and carbs. If you are able to tolerate any plants at all and they don't cause you gut issues, great, they did cause me gut issues. So that's why I eat only meat, eggs, and a little bit of dairy. That's what works best for me. But find the plan that you think will work best for you. I would encourage you to also add in some movement. Walks are fabulous. If you can get outside and walk, do it. I've put out a lot of videos about the benefits of meat and walks, but get a plan. I would have a plan for your food, a plan for movement, a plan for how to sleep, and a plan for how to deal with stress. If you are working in those four areas and you have a plan, 
you're going to get better results than just going, I need to lose weight. I need to lose weight. Great. What's your plan? And as you start to implement that plan, I would start looking for some confirmation that it's working, not just on an overall body scale. You can use body composition scales to show if you are decreasing body fat while increasing muscle. You could take measurements, have a good snug pair of honesty pants that do keep you honest. Are you actually getting any smaller? Are you feeling better? Evaluate the pain. Evaluate your sleep. How are you feeling throughout the day? How are your moods, your energy? All of this is looking for some confirmation that your plan is working. Continue to have hope and then continue to realize that the desperation that you felt is going to drive you towards making the change. Those four aspects are what I encourage my group members to fill out and reflect on as their four steps their own why, their desperation, the hope, the plan, and then looking for scale victories, non-scale victories, confirmation that they are on the right path. Now, past that, I have some folks who say, okay, I get that, but I'm still just struggling to get off the ground and actually do this. All right. When I have had moments of either wanting to quit or wanting to cheat or go off plan or go back to just old behaviors. What I want you to realize is that we have within us a limbic system. This is the reward center of our brain. This is where I would call like our lizard brain, the voice of addiction. Dr. Joan Ifland talks about that a lot. The voice of self-sabotage, addiction, whatever you want to call it. That limbic system is what gives us a very temporary high or feeling of euphoria when we eat anything that is addictive or have a behavior that is addictive for us. So for people with a gambling addiction, that's part of the brain. The limbic system is what gives them that high when they are at a slot machine. I don't get that. But I did used to get that high, that euphoria, that big dopamine hit of chemicals in the brain when I had a hit of processed foods, sugary, carby, processed foods to be more specific. And one thing I had to learn about that little hit is it's very temporary. It's a good time in the moment. Am I right? That five to 10 minutes when you're consuming the thing, and sometimes it's even less time than that, right? A quick binge on something, you go, whoo, the noise stops, the buzzing of the bees of cravings and the hard feelings and the emotion. It all goes quiet for just a few minutes. And then what? it's temporary then that voice of addiction wants more 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 it's relentless so whether you are addicted to the gambling the alcohol the drugs or sugary processed carbs you just need to know that the hit you receive is very temporary it is relentless you will never get enough to satisfy a craving in fact the more you have the more you'll want that's how addiction works so it's a step one let's eliminate some things from this equation such as Hunger, if you're truly hungry, or even if you're not sure, get some real food, nutrients, get some meat, people. You're going to get fat for your hormones and to satisfy the feelings of hunger. Get some protein, which also we need enough protein to satisfy our cravings. There have been overfeeding studies shown that until people get enough fat and protein, meat, that they will continue to want and want and want. But once they've hit that, they've had enough protein protein and fat, then the cravings start to subside. So I would start with there. Fill up on meat. So at least you know, okay, I'm not hungry. Now what? Then it's also helpful to learn how to sit and have a feeling, to feel the things. So if you are dealing with anger or jealousy, you're sad, you're grieving, whatever it is in that moment, accepting the fact that we are humans with real emotions that we don't have to numb or throw like a hot potato. I know a lot of us grew up thinking, unless you are happy, shiny, helpful, then you're doing something wrong and we have to squash all of that and get rid of it. That's just not true. It's not true. We can sit and feel something really intense and hard and we can learn to do that in very short bursts without trying to distract ourselves. So you can distract yourself in healthy ways such as get out of the house, take a walk. Um, Maybe there's a game you love to play. Maybe there's somebody you love to talk to. Maybe you distract yourself in beautiful ways such as journaling, prayer, meditation, 
all of that is great, but drowning our sorrows in either alcohol or addictive behaviors or the processed sugary carbs, not helpful. And our feelings can't actually hurt us. Those emotions can't harm us, but the things we turn to can, if you gamble away in that moment or do a ton of online shopping, then your finances suffer. If you turn to the processed sugary carbs, our bodies suffer. Then we end up with these long-term issues that we're trying so desperately to get away from. So it's how we cope that ends up hurting us, not the actual feelings and emotions in themselves. So we just have to practice feeling the things. I get it. Not fun, not easy, hard work. Therapy can help, but so can a friend. Prayer, Bible study, having a group, a group setting, group support, somebody to talk it out can be very helpful. But what's not helpful is giving in to the addiction and going back to the same toxic foods and behaviors that got us exactly in the mess that we're in in the first place. Not helpful. That is not true comfort. Okay, back to the brain. We talked about the limbic system, the voice of addiction, the reward center of the brain. Have the food, have the thing, drink the alcohol. The opposite of that voice, the counter voice to that is our frontal lobe. Oh, <laughs> our frontal lobe. We're going to think of it right up here. Is the part of our brain that looks forward Look ahead to tomorrow, babe. Think about tomorrow. Will you be glad that you ate this thing today when you wake up tomorrow? Will you be glad that you had the binge tomorrow? Voice of addiction is like, yeah, you'll be glad. Frontal lobe was like, hold on, let me think about tomorrow morning. No, no one's ever glad they binged on carbs or wasted their money on stupid things on Amazon or at the slot machine or drank the alcohol. When it's tomorrow morning... So we can project, we use our frontal lobe and think, think it through, all the way through. It's a package deal. What is this food or behavior going to do and how am I going to feel about it tomorrow or in five days, five years, or in 50 years? We've got to get a grip and our frontal lobe is how we're going to do that. Get this. When our limbic system, the voice of self-sabotage lizard brain is engaged, it actually, and we can see this on brain scans, shuts down our frontal lobe. So this bad guy back here, which isn't entirely bad, but it's not helpful when it comes to addiction, will actually slow down and shut off the most helpful part of our brain, our frontal lobe. And do you know what turns this guy on full force? The first taste of that addictive thing. So the very first quarter in the slot machine or the first shot of alcohol or the first bite, one little bite, and that's what it tells you. Just have one bite and then I'll leave you alone. No, no, it's the worst thing we can do is that first taste, first bite, that first little piece of candy. No, it tells you that that's what will shut it off. That's when I'll leave you alone. That's when... The frontal lobe slows. The brakes are off, baby. That forward-thinking, decision-making part of our brain is shut off. And now this guy gets a total pass and all go. And then tomorrow morning when the frontal lobe re-engages, we're like, why did I do that? Why did I go back to those old coping techniques? Why am I back in pain? Why am I now having cravings? Why am I now having to deal with all of the aftermath? when I was doing so well. Why? Because you had the first bite, you shut down your frontal lobe, and then you turned this guy full force. That's why. So in that moment, instead of turning him on even more, I would strongly associate whatever those foods and behaviors are that are the issue for you with the exact results that they give. And I wouldn't just wait till the moment when you're sitting there with the bag of candy or with the pizza or with the alcohol or the slot machine. You need to do it pretty often. Maybe make it a daily habit of why you don't engage with those foods and behaviors. What exact issues do they cause you? So for me, I used to eat donuts. 
I knew they weren't great for me. I wanted to stop. I would say, I'll just have one. And then I would have the entire dozen, literally, in my car. And then afterwards, I felt so guilty and ashamed and bad for myself. And then I felt literally sick. Why did I do this? Then the guilt and shame didn't drive me towards better choices. It actually drove me to more sugar, more donuts. So instead, reflect. What pain did it cause? Well, I used to have sternum pain, costochondritis. It was miserable. I used to also have boils and I weighed 260 pounds. Associate what did that with exactly what pain it caused for me? Because humans hate pain. We will try very hard to avoid pain. In fact, eating donuts made me think I was avoiding emotional pain in that moment because for that few glorious minutes in my car I was turning off emotional pain but ultimately I was bringing more pain into my life tons of physical emotional long-term pain into my life by making those choices so we have to make the neural pathways in our brain strong to say donuts oh my gosh that is what caused me to have this And also know that if you do have those sweet tasting, junky, sugary processed foods, it's not just going to affect you today and it's not going to just affect your blood sugar and your inflammation and your sleep and all of that. Yes, it's also going to give you intense cravings. Well, it did for me (laughs) for days and it's going to make your good food taste worse for days. If I was ever on a good streak of eating well, and then I gave in and had junk, especially sweet junk, well, your steak is not going to taste as good. Even bacon and eggs, you're going to go from thinking, oh, this food is so good, to then, meh, because that voice of addiction is not getting what it wants. You may even have meat aversions. You're going to have to go through the withdrawal all over again. Is that really what you want? I think not. So... When you do feel very overwhelmed, I would buy yourself a little bit of time. Step outside, take some deep breaths, get away from the scene, whatever that scene is, whether it's the casino at Vegas, the bar, or the Little Debbie aisle, or your pantry in your house. If you've still got that mess in your house, by the way, get rid of it, if at all possible. I understand you may have carb eaters living in your house. Ask for their help. Hide it. Get it out of sight, out of mind, lock it away, put it in the trunk, take it to work, or trash it, dish soap it, whatever you have to do. But buy yourself a little time, get outside, take a walk, do some exercise. In fact, getting your heart rate up and getting blood flowing is an actual proven way to work through a really intense craving for and struggle with any addiction. Addiction recovery programs that include exercise as a very purposeful, planned out part of recovery prove to be 70% more effective when it comes to people actually breaking the addiction and saying that it felt easier to them. So move your body, right? I'm trying to keep this video short. Hopefully that'll help you through some tough times. I have another video on 20 tips to break sugar addiction if you need a little more detail. And I also run support groups every single month where you can get together with people who are on the same path with a coach who has been there, done that, lived it. I get it. It wasn't easy, but I made it through that once and I'm never going to do it again. I never have to go through that again because I'm free now. If you want that same freedom, I would love to work with you. Find your tribe, get a coach, and let's do this together. And as always, let's eat the meat, save the humans. Bye.